This lesson is an introduction to several models of ethical decision making. Human service professionals are often faced with situations that require sound ethical decision making ability. Determining the appropriate course of action to take when faced with a difficult ethical dilemma can be a challenge. While codes of ethics and codes of conduct can be helpful, they are often insufficient to resolve ethical dilemmas. This lesson will provide you with a process that can be used when the codes of ethics or conduct do not provide a clear answer to what actions are appropriate to take. The lesson involves watching the attached video. Additionally, there are two articles included in the lesson media section of this lesson for you to download and review. Also, for your convenience, there is a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slides from the video. After you have completed all components of the lesson, you are required to pass the attached quiz with a passing score of at least 70% to successfully complete the lesson. Several foundational principles are the underpinnings of best ethical practice and are viewed as central to the process of ethical decision making within the helping professions. There are five general principles, autonomy, justice, beneficence, non-maleficence, and fidelity. These five principles are the cornerstone of ethical guidelines for professionals. Ethical guidelines cannot address all situations that a professional is forced to confront. Reviewing these ethical principles, which serve as the foundation of the guidelines, often helps to clarify the issues involved in a given situation. The five bedrock principles of autonomy, justice, beneficence, non-maleficence, and fidelity are each vital in and of themselves to a healthy professional relationship. By exploring an ethical dilemma with regard to these principles, a professional may come to a better understanding of the conflicting issues. A description of each of the five foundational principles is presented in the next slides. Autonomy is the principle that addresses respect for independence and self-determination. The essence of this principle is allowing an individual the freedom of choice and action. It addresses the responsibility of the professional to encourage clients, when appropriate, to make their own decisions and to act on their own values. There are two important considerations in encouraging clients to be autonomous. First, helping clients to understand how their decisions and their values may be received within the context of the society in which they live and how those decisions may impinge on the rights of others. The second consideration is related to the client's ability to make sound and rational decisions. Persons not capable of making competent choices, such as children, and some individuals with mental disabilities should not be allowed to act on decisions that could harm themselves or others. Justice has been defined as treating equals equally and unequals unequally but in proportion to their relevant differences. Justice does not mean treating all individuals the same. If an individual is to be treated differently, the professional needs to be able to offer a rationale that explains the necessity and appropriateness of treating the individual differently. An example of justice is that a professional would give a person who is blind a form that is in braille or would go through the form with that individual orally instead of giving him or her a standard written form to fill out but the professional would treat him or her the same way as any other client in all other regards.
Beneficence reflects the professional's responsibility to contribute to the welfare of the client. Simply stated, it means to do good, to be proactive, and also to prevent harm when possible. Beneficence can come in many forms, such as prevention and early intervention actions that contribute to the betterment of clients. Non-maleficence is the concept of not causing harm to others. Often explained as above all, do no harm, this principle is considered by some to be the most critical of all of the principles, even though theoretically they are all of equal weight. This principle reflects both the idea of not inflicting intentional harm and not engaging in actions that risk harming others. Weighing potential harm against potential benefits is important in a professional's efforts toward ensuring no harm. Fidelity involves the notions of loyalty, faithfulness, and honoring commitments. Clients must be able to trust the professional and have faith in the relationship if growth is to occur. Therefore, the professional must take care not to threaten the relationship or to leave obligations unfulfilled. When exploring an ethical dilemma, the professional needs to examine the situation and how each of the principles we have discussed may apply to that particular case. At times, this examination alone will clarify the issues so that the means for resolving the dilemma becomes clear. When an, an initial review of the five foundational principles does not provide direction, it is helpful to be able to work through the steps of an ethical decision-making model. Initially, we will discuss a generic seven-step model that includes identifying the problem, consulting the code of ethics, determining the nature of the dilemma, generating possible courses of actions, considering potential consequences, evaluating the selected course of action, and finally implementing the course of action. Later, we will present other models for ethical decision making. The first step is to identify the problem. Here we want to gather as much information as we can that will illuminate the situation. In doing so, it is important to be as specific and objective as possible. Writing ideas on paper often helps provide clarity. We want to outline the facts, separating out innuendos, assumptions, hypotheses, or suspicions. There are several questions we need to ask ourselves. Is it an ethical, legal, professional, or clinical problem? Is it a combination of more than one of these? If it is a legal question, be sure to seek legal advice. Other questions that may be useful to ask ourselves are, is the issue related to me and what I am or am not doing? Is it related to the client? and or the client's significant others and what they are or are not doing? Is it related to technology in the provision of services or in the storage of records? Is it related to the institution or agency and their policies and procedures? If the problem can be resolved by implementing a policy of an institution or agency, we can look to the agency's guidelines. It is important to remember that the dilemmas professionals face are often complex. Therefore, a useful guideline is to examine the problem from several perspectives and avoid searching for an overly simplistic solution. The second step is to apply your code of ethics or your agency's code of conduct. After having clarified the problem, Refer to your code of ethics to see if the issue is addressed 
Also consider your agency's code of conduct and any other state or professional codes that may apply to you. When reviewing the ethical codes, be sure to consider any multicultural perspectives of the particular case. Remember to examine all the nu nuisances that exist when technology is involved. If there is an applicable standard or several standards and they are specific and clear, follow the course of action indicated should lead you to a resolution of the problem. To be able to apply the ethical standards, it is essential that you have read them carefully and that you understand their implications. If the problem is not resolved by reviewing the Code of Ethics, then you have a complex ethical dilemma and need to proceed with further steps in the ethical decision-making process. If it is a complex ethical dilemma, you should take time to thoroughly analyze and assess all aspects of the situation and its potential solutions. The third step is to determine the nature and dimensions of the ethical dilemma. There are a few steps to follow to ensure that you have examined the problem in all of its various dimensions. First, examine the dilemma's implications from each of the foundational principles, autonomy, justice, beneficence, non-maleficence, and fidelity. Decide which of the principles apply to this specific situation and determine which principle takes priority for you in this case. In theory, each principle is of equal value, which means that you will need to use your professional judgment to determine the priorities when two or more of them are in conflict. Next, review the relevant professional literature to ensure that you are using the most current professional thinking and are aware of the diversity issues involved in the particular situation. And finally, consult with experienced professionals and or supervisors. As they review with you the information you've gathered, they may help you to see other issues that are relevant or to prov provide a perspective that you have not considered. They may also be able to identify aspects of the dilemma that you are not viewing objectively. The fourth step is to generate potential courses of action. Here we want to brainstorm as many potential actions as possible. We want to be creative and list all of the options that we can think of, even ones that we're sure will, will not work or <laughs> ones that we are not sure will work. In the brainstorming phase, we want to generate as many possible solutions we do not, during this phase, worry about judging or eliminating solutions. We will evaluate them in the next step. Whenever possible, consult with at least one colleague to help us generate options. The fifth step is to consider the potential consequences of all of the options and select a course of action. Considering the information that we've gathered and the priorities that we've set, we want to evaluate each of the options, being sure to assess the potential consequences for all of the parties involved. Ponder the implications of each course of action for the client, for others who will be affected, and for ourselves as professionals. We want to eliminate the options that clearly do not give the desired results or that cause even more problematic consequences. Finally, we review the remaining options to determine which option or combination of option best fits the situation and addresses the priorities that we have identified. The sixth step is to evaluate the selected course of action. Here we want to review the selected course of action to see if it presents any new ethical considerations. 
we want to apply three simple tests to the selected course of action to ensure that it is appropriate. Those tests are justice, publicity, and universality. Justice suggests that we assess our own sense of fairness by determining whether we would treat others the same in this situation. For the test of publicity, we want to ask ourselves whether we would want our behavior reported in the press. And finally, the test of universality asks us to assess whether we could recommend the same course of action to another professional in the same, same situation. If the course of action we have selected causes any new ethical issues, then we'll need to go back to the beginning and reevaluate each step of the process. Perhaps we have chosen the wrong op option or we may have identified the problem incorrectly. If we can answer in the affirmative to each of the questions and have passed the test of justice, publicity, and universality, and we are satisfied that we've selected an appropriate course of action, then we're ready to move on to implementation. And finally, when we've been through all of the steps, we want to implement the chosen course of action. Here we want to strengthen our resolve to allow us to carry out the plan. Just because it is the right decision does not mean it will be easy to implement. Taking the appropriate action in an ethical dilemma is often difficult. After implementing our course of action, it is a good practice to follow up on the situation to assess whether our actions had the anticipated effect and the preferred consequences. The foundational principles previously identified are not the only principles used to define ethical decisions. One alternative is presented here. In this alternative, the principles are utilitarianism, rights, fairness, common good, and virtue. In the utilitarian value, it is all about balance, and this approach tries to produce the greatest good with the least amount of harm to those who are involved. It deals with consequences, and practitioners who use this method are trying to find the best ethical approach for the most people. Under rights, when we make a rights approach decision, we are looking to protect and respect the rights and morals of anyone who could be impacted by the decision that is made. The intent is for people to be treated fairly and with dignity, and not as a means to an end. The Fairness Doctrine states that everyone should be treated equally, regardless of their position or influence in a company with the exception mentioned in the Fairness Principle previously. Next is common good. We should strive to protect the well-being of those around us. This ethical standard puts a lot of emphasis on relationships and how compassion for our fellow man should drive us to do good by others. And finally, virtue. In a virtue approach, it requires us to base our ethical standards on universal values such as honesty, courage, compassion, and tolerance. Principles that are chosen, chosen should cause people to strive to be better themselves and wonder if an appropriate action will negatively impact their inherent desire to be kind to others. Another set of principles for ethical decision-making is described by the PLUS acronym, referring to policies and procedures, legality, universality, and self-evaluation. Under policies and procedures, we need to ask ourselves, is the decision that we are going to be making in line with the policies of the company? Under the legal area, we need to ask ourselves the question, 
will the decision that we're making violate any legal parameters or regulations? Under universality, we ask ourselves the question, how does this relate to the values and principles established for my agency to operate? Is it in tune with the core values and the company culture? And finally, under the self area, we ask ourselves, does this decision meet my standards of fairness and justice? This particular filter fits well with the virtue approach that is a part of the five common standards that we have mentioned previously. In addition to alternative foundational principles, I also wish to produce an alternative ethical decision-making model called the ethics model. The ethics model is a theoretically grounded ethical decision-making model that draws from the latest relevant literature in ethics. The theoretical framework for this model includes utilitarianism, moral relativism, and moral absolutism. This allows a shared focus on consequences and liability, as well as individual and societal good. The ethics model is appropriate for practitioners of all levels and can be used with a variety of situations. The steps of the model are evaluate the dilemma, think ahead, help, information, calculate risk, and select an action. The first step in the ethics model is to evaluate the dilemma. The identification and evaluation of the ethical dilemma in a situation is the most critical aspect of the ethics model. Understanding the ethical dilemma provides the framework and justification for the application of the model. The identification and evaluation of an ethical dilemma draws from the application of the code of ethics to a situation. In some cases, the code provides absolute clarity on an ethical question. However, in other cases, the ethical course of action is less clear. Benke described this challenge of ethics codes by using the metaphor of a stoplight. In this metaphor, ethics codes can be seen as communi <coughs> communicating prohibited behavior via a red light permitting behavior via a green light, and behavior where caution is warranted as a yellow light. In many situations, several components of the ethics code may be applicable and may communicate different messages about the most ethical course of action. In these situations, where the code is not clear and consistent about the ethical course of action, a decision-making model is necessary. For the purpose of this ethical decision-making model, an ethical dilemma is defined as a situation where ethical codes may be violated regardless of the course of action taken. Specifically, an ethical dilemma is where no ideal course of action exists. Consequently, the most ethical course of action is dependent upon a thorough analysis of the possible courses of action, the weighing of various courses of action, and a conscious decision to engage in a course of action that may potentially violate an ethical code. In short, an ethical dilemma is a situation that places ethical codes in opposition to one another. In order to identify and evaluate the ethical dilemma in a situation, professionals should first identify the possible courses of actions moving forward, and then thoroughly review what codes might be relevant to those courses of action. With each option, ethical codes may either support the option or potentially be violated by the option. In some cases, a code that supports one option may be violated by another option. Counselors must ensure that their options are those that a reasonably prudent professional might consider. 
Identification of the options requires professionals to understand and evaluate the various dimensions of the ethical situation. It is often helpful to start with the various questions that the professional needs to consider in the situation. This allows the professional to, to determine which aspects of the ethical situation require an ethical decision-making model and which are answered by virtue of the ethical code. By engaging in this process, professionals can winnow down the dilemma to focus only on the dimensions that are central to the dilemma. As professionals consider courses of action in an ethical situation, three potential categories of actions may exist. First, a course of action may exist where no codes have the potential to be violated. In this situation, no ethical dilemma exists and there is no need to apply an ethical decision-making model. Second, a course of action may exist where the option violates codes and there are no codes that support the course of action. In this situation, this course of action should not be considered. Third, a course of action may exist where codes are simultaneously supported and violated by the course of action. We have found that this third situation is most common and there are usually multiple courses of action that fall into this category. By engaging in this strategy, it becomes clear when an ethical dilemma exists as there are no options that allow the professional to resolve the ethical situation without potentially violating an ethical code. Once an ethical dilemma is identified and evaluated, it becomes clear that the rest of the ethics model is necessary to determine which course of action is most ethical. That is, because regardless of what course of action is taken, an ethical code may be violated. It is also important that once an ethical dilemma is identified, professionals do not prematurely decide on a course of action. The ethics model is an ethical decision-making model designed to help a professional determine the most ethical course of action rather than justify a course of action that has pre been prematurely selected. The second step in this model is to think ahead. After identifying the ethical dilemma present in the situation, the next step is to think ahead to the various outcomes of each possible course of action. This involves evaluating each option independently to determine all foreseeable repercussions, both positive and negative. By doing so and analyzing all repercussions, professionals weigh the support or lack of support for each option. In essence, this process takes a utilitarian perspective to encourage seeking the greatest good for the most clients. In addition, counselors have an ethical responsibility to avoid actions that cause harm. Consequently, the think ahead step is in alignment with the beneficence and non-maleficence principles of professional ethical behavior. The process of thinking ahead begins by first acknowledging all constituents or stakeholders whom the outcomes of the action selected are likely to affect. While this always includes the client and the professional directly involved in the situation, other constituents may include but not be limited to other clients of the professional, colleagues, and the profession as a whole. Considering all relevant constituents allows the professional to consider the totality of the situation. The outcomes of each possible action should then be systemically evaluated in relation to all potentially affected constituents. Professionals should think of this as determining the advantages and disadvantages of each option. The professional must indicate how each action will affect all relevant parties and whether the effect will be positive or negative. In short, professionals are assessing whether each outcome lends 
support for a particular action or is against it. The third step in the ethics model is to seek help. In addition to thinking ahead to outcomes, it is important to receive help from consultants. This is supported by the moral relativism perspective, which encourages cons consultation regarding relevant industry standard practices. By attempting to determine what most professionals would do, courses of action may be conceptualized within a societal and multicultural context. In this step of the model, it is important that professionals distinguish between receiving help and receiving a decision from a consultant. The former is a component of good ethical decision making, whereas the latter moves the responsibility for the decision away from the professional. Although it is important for professionals to consider information received from consultants, this help should be combined with analysis from the other steps of the ethics model. Consequently, effectively seeking help involves knowing what questions to ask as well as whom to ask. For example, asking what should I do would not be an effective use of help. However, asking in this situation does this aspect of the code apply would be an effective use of help. In the former situation, the counselor is asking to receive a decision from a consultant. In the latter, the professional is asking for clarification that may affect the decision-making process. Drawing from the framework posited by Benke, questions for consultation can fall into one of four categories, legal, ethical, clinical, or risk management. Legal questions involve how laws and regulations may apply to the situation. Ethical questions relate to the interpretation of the ethics code. Clinical questions comprise how actions may affect the best interest of the client, whereas risk management questions are concerned with exposure to liability. Benke suggested that each question informs with whom the professional should seek help. Legal questions may require an attorney. Ethical questions may necessitate a supervisor or even an ethics board. Clinical questions certainly would involve a supervisor or a senior experienced clinician. And risk management questions suggest consulting a risk management professional. The help a professional receives from a consultant is then examined in combination with other information from other steps of the model, either to lend support for or against an option. Given that an ethical situation may require help related to multiple facets, professionals should repeat this process for each question where help is needed. Thus, this step guides professionals to be more intentional in receiving help rather than relying on a consultant to make a decision for them. The fourth step in the ethics process is to gather information. The information step involves considering literature, regulations, and law that pertains to the dilemma and combining it with analysis from the other steps of the model. The professional should think of this as seeking information from available written sources. Since laws, regulations, and best practices may change over time, it is important for the professional to have the most up-to-date information. This is in line with the perspective of moral relativism, which suggests that professionals educate themselves with current relevant literature based on industry standard practices within a societal and multicultural context. Thus, in gathering relevant sources, professionals should ensure that they are examining current literature. Next, the professional considers how information from each source either supports or discourages each of the possible actions. This process is done for each source separately. The professional should remember to stay open to any and all information they find 
and how it applies to the decision at hand. By doing so, the professional remains unbiased as they consider how information found applies to the options. The fifth step in the ethics model is to calculate risk. Since all professional practice involves risk, it is important to calculate how each option might impact our exposure to liability and fulfillment of responsibility. This step is supported by the moral absolutism perspective, which encourages following rules and avoiding, avoiding harm over the consequences of each option. This is in direct contrast and serves to balance the utilitarianism perspective used in the think ahead step. During this step, professionals should revisit the various stakeholders identified in the think ahead step. It is likely that for each of these stakeholders, the professional has some exposure to risk. Parsing out the risk allows for the consideration that any option may simultaneously increase and decrease the exposure to risk for different stakeholders. In other words, while an option may have the effect of reducing the professional's exposure to liability for one client, it may simultaneously increase the professional's exposure to liability for a different client. In considering the stakeholders separately, professionals can begin to calculate the overall risk any option might create. The final step in the ethics model is to select an action. During this step, the professional determines the most ethical and least ethical courses of action. This decision should be in alignment with the evidence gathered during all previous steps. If the professional has properly implemented the ethical decision-making model, the decision should logically follow. It is imperative that the professional does not make a decision until they reach this step of the model, making a premature decision about the most ethical course of action is likely to create bias and blind us against evidence that supports any alternative choices. The ethics model both supports a selected course of action and also memorializes the thought process used to reach that decision. Further, the ethics model allows for effective communication of a decision-making model should the professional's action ever be questioned. Since good ethical decision-making requires assess assessing the full impact of any actions taken, the ethics model gives professionals the tools to make an ethically informed decision that is defensible and in alignment with be best practices. Thank you for completing this lesson on models of ethical decision making. Please remember to download the two articles in the lesson media section and review them. Additionally, for your convenience, there is a copy of this PowerPoint presentation in the lesson media section. After you've completed the review of all of the material, you are required to pass the attached quiz with a passing score of at least 70% to successfully complete this lesson. Thank you and good luck.